Welcome to my video on antibacterial drugs. The topics covered in this lecture are listed below. I'll talk about how we can determine whether an antibacterial agent has bactericidal activity or bacteriostatic activity by performing a dilution susceptibility test. I'll go over the importance of a therapeutic index as well as the margin of safety. Next, I'll discuss how we can determine whether an antibacterial agent has a narrow spectrum or a broad spectrum activity. And we'll do that by using a disc diffusion test or the Kirby-Bauer assay. Lastly, I'll discuss the six modes of action that all antibacterial reagents can be classified as. And then I'll mention the four general ways in which a bacteria can become resistant to these antibacterial reagents. So let's begin by defining what an antibacterial drug is. These drugs are chemicals that are found in nature or are synthetically made and that work to destroy or interfere with microbial structures as well as their enzymes. Now these drugs will either actively kill bacterial cells or they'll inhibit their growth. But either way, they have to have little or no harm to the host, meaning us. Now these antibacterial drugs are defined as either being bactericidal or bacteriostatic. It depends on their effects of the bacteria. So bactericidal drugs are drugs that will kill their targeted bacteria, whereas the bacteriostatic drugs will cause a reversible inhibition of growth. This basically means that the bacterial growth can restart when the drug is eliminated or removed from the bacteria. Now the choice of whether to use a bactericidal or bacteriostatic drug will depend on the immune status of the patient. So for example, if a patient has a very strong immune system, such as a patient who is not immunocompromised, both a bactericidal and a bacteriostatic drug can be used effectively in treating that patient. However, if the patient is immunocompromised, a bactericidal drug is essential for the success and treatment of that infection simply because the bacteriostatic drug will rely on the patient's immune system to stop, uh, to step up and help fight against the infection. But if the patient's immune system is unable to help the drug in its functions, then the bacteriostatic drug's ability to eliminate the infection has been greatly reduced. Now, regardless of whether the antibacterial drug is bactericidal or bacteriostatic, it's important that the drug has selective toxicity. And that means that it will selectively uh, harm the bacterial pathogen and have no effect or little effect on the patient. So in other words, it's important that the drug targets the bacteria by killing it or preventing it from growing while causing little or no harm to the patient. So the two main components here are effectiveness in treating the disease with selective toxicity. The therapeutic index will use these two components in order to determine the safetiness of a drug, in this case, our antibacterial drug. So the therapeutic index is going to compare the concentration of the drug that is that gives a toxic effect on patients versus the concentration that is effective in treating the disease. So the goal here is for the drug to have a very high therapeutic index, which means that the toxic dose concentration is much higher than the effective dose concentration. So it's going to be an indication of the safetiness of this drug. Now this slide is just an example of how a therapeutic index is actually calculated. There's two components of the index that you need to understand. First is the TD50 or the toxic dose 50. And that's indicated here on this graph in the green line. So there's gonna be various populations of, of subjects. Usually these tests start out with lab animals. Then the same study moves on to patients in clinical trials. So we're gonna talk in relation to patients. So we're gonna have various patients, different groups, and they'll each receive a different concentration of the antibacterial drug. And we'll monitor them over time for any toxic effects. So the graph, the, the x-axis of this graph ranges from 0 to 10,000. 
um, and that is uh, the value would be milligrams per kilogram. Now, if you notice the green curve, it starts out with 10 to the one, so that's 10 uh, milligrams per kilogram. At that concentration, there's very low toxic effect. Whereas if we go above 10,000, that's 10 to the four, then there's 100% toxicity within the population of those patients. So we're gonna look at the percentage within that population. So if we carry the, the blue dotted line from 50% and then bring it down, the toxic dose is 500 milligrams per kilogram. That means that if we give patients 500 milligrams per kilogram, half of the population receiving this dose will have a toxic dose. That's the TD50. Likewise, the ED50, that's the effective or the therapeutic dose. And again, that's the dose in which 50% of the population will have an effective, um, an effective treatment. So the dose that is effective inhibiting or killing bacteria in 50% of the population. So the TI or the therapeutic index is a ratio of the toxic dose 50 over the effective dose 50. So I've entered the values here, 500 milligrams per kilogram, and we're gonna divide that by five milligrams per kilogram. And notice that milligrams per kilograms cancel out. So 500 divided by five is 100. So now let's compare this result with a second example. Now look carefully at the curve and you're gonna notice that the two curves have moved closer together. The ED50 is 10 milligrams per kilogram and the TD50 is 100 milligrams per kilogram. So when you calculate the ratio, you put 100 divided by 10 and the therapeutic index is now 10. As opposed, if you remember previously, the therapeutic index was 100 whereas in this second case, it is just a 10. So why is that important? So basically the take home message is that the larger the therapeutic index is, the safer the antibacterial drug will be to the patient. Now pharmaceutical companies also calculate what is known as the margin of safety. So remember the therapeutic index was a TD50 over an ED50, but a margin of safety is actually more stringent. It will take the ratio of the TD01, or the concentration in which 1% of the population had a toxic dose, over the ED99. So we require that 99% of the population has an effective dose. So this safety indicator is a lot more stringent than the therapeutic index. Now, if you recall at the beginning of this video, I told you that antibacterial drugs are either found naturally or they are synthesized. You probably heard the term antibiotics. Not all antibacterial drugs are antibiotics. In nature, bacteria and fungi produce antibacterial drugs, and these are known as antibiotics, so they're naturally made. Chemists, on the other hand, have taken these antibiotics and have modified them so that we can increase their usefulness. The usefulness could increase the, the amount of bacteria in which they are effective against. It could allow a patient to uh, take the antibacterial drug through uh, orally as opposed to intramuscularly. It can also decrease the toxic effect. So an antibiotic that's been modified by, by man, by a chemist, they are now known as a semi-synthetic antibacterial drug. So whether a drug is naturally made, semi-synthetic or completely man-made, its effective use is determined partially by which bacteria it can inhibit its growth or outright kill. So there's gonna be a series of tests that, that occurs in the lab to determine which bacteria can be killed by these antibacterial reagents. A narrow spectrum antibacterial drug will target only a specific subset of bacteria. Now, some of these narrow spectrum uh, antibacterial drugs will target a small group of gram positives, whereas others may target a small group of gram negative bacteria. But generally speaking, a narrow spectrum antibacterial drug will never include a population of bacteria that includes both the gram positives and the gram negatives. Now, how does that differ from the broad spectrum? Now, a broad spectrum is effective against a wider group, a larger population of bacteria, and usually it does include both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. 
So again, this is all generally speaking. So we need to determine this. We need to, to actually test these drugs in a lab before we can actually give them to patients. So how do we know whether a drug is bacteriostatic or bactericidal? How do we know its effective use? Is it a narrow or a broad spectrum? How do we know the therapeutic index? So there's a lot of lab tests that need to be performed before this drug is actually put on the market. So I'll start by showing you how we can determine whether an antibacterial agent is bacteriostatic or bactericidal. There's going to be two different tests that, we're going to, that we can perform. The first one is a dilution susceptibility test, and the second one is the disk diffusion test. So let's start with the dilution susceptibility test. Now this test will tell you the lowest concentration of antibacterial reagents that are needed to actually inhibit growth, so visibly inhibit growth. We call this the minimal inhibitory concentration, and you'll probably hear it as the MIC. So this assay is a dilution susceptibility test, and we're gonna perform it in a broth. Now I have pictures of test tubes, but we can also perform these in microtiter plates. So on the left is a negative control tube, and on the right is a positive control tube, and we're gonna have a series of tubes in between. But let me introduce you to the controls. In the negative control tube, we're going to have a known concentration of antibacterial drugs. And it's going to be the highest concentration that we're testing. So I have here that the amount of drug is 16 micrograms per mil, and we have no bacteria in there. So it's a negative control so that we should not see any bacterial growth. And when I say see growth, we're going to measure that by, by visually inspecting the tubes for cloudiness or turbidity. Now the tube on the right is the positive control because in this tube there's no antibacterial reagents or drugs that are added. Only we're, we're only going to add 5 times 10 to the 5th bacterial cells per mil. Now notice that this concentration is low enough that you don't see cloudiness in the tube. That's very important. You don't want to start seeing bacterial growth. You want to actually allow the growth to occur overnight. So let's include the other tubes that we'll have in this assay. Now notice the drug concentrations from left to right. We have a second tube from the left that also has 16 micrograms per mil, but this tube is different than the first in such that it also has bacterial cells. Going from there, we go from 16 to 8, 8 to 4, 4 to 2, and then 2 to 0. We're, con we're continuing to reduce the concentration of antibacterial drug. But notice in the all the tubes except for the one on the left, except for our negative control, they all have the same amount of bacteria and all the tubes appear clear. So we've set up these, these test tubes. We're gonna incubate them in a temperature that allows the bacteria to grow. When we come back, we're gonna look for cloudiness or turbidity. And so notice in this assay that the tube, our positive control is very, very cloudy. There's, there was no inhibition of growth and the bacteria should grow. And so that this is telling us that our, re, our test is actually working correctly. Likewise, our negative control remained clear. So what we're really interested in looking at the test reactions. And what you can notice is that the tube that received two micrograms per mil is cloudy, whereas the tubes that, re, that received four, eight, or 16 micrograms per mil, they still seem to appear clear. So in this case, we're going to say that the minimal inhibitory concentration, the least amount of antibacterial drug in this assay that was needed to prevent visible growth is four micrograms per mil. Now this test also allows us to look at the minimal bactericidal concentration. Now notice in these tubes, four, eight, and 16 in our test reactions, we're not seeing any growth, but that's not telling us that the bacteria is dead. The bacteria might be alive, but it may not have been able to grow. So we want to determine the next value, and that's the MBC, or the minimal bactericidal concentration. So how much antibacterial agents do we need to add to actually kill the bacteria? So we're going to go back to our test tubes, and we're going to actually sample them. So on the lower right, I have a Petri dish, and basically I've taken a swab, and I've dipped into each of these tubes and I've streaked the surface of a, of a auger plate uh, on, with the cultures 
And what the agar plate does is it removes any antibacterial reagents that are present in the tube away from the bacteria. Now the theory is, is that if the bacteria is alive, it will be able to grow on the plate in the absence of the antibacterial reagent. So if you look at this plate, this plate has been incubated for at least 18 hours and our negative control is clear. Our positive control has a fair amount of growth. And if you continue and look at the, go from clockwise on the plate, two micrograms and four micrograms per mil, there's bacterial growth. If you look at the well, uh, the sections of the plate that is labeled 816 micrograms per mil, there is no growth. So that means the least amount of, of antibacterial reagents that is needed to kill the bacteria is now eight micrograms per mil. Remember the MIC was four micrograms per mil. The MBC in this case is eight micrograms per mil. So this assay helped us determine whether the antibacterial drug is going to be bactericidal in activity or bacteriostatic in activity. For instance, with this particular drug, we know that four micrograms per mil is going to have bacteriostatic activity on this bacteria. It will not kill the bacteria, but it will inhibit its growth. If we increase the concentration, however, to eight micrograms per mil, then the antibacterial drug now has bactericidal activity. The next question that we can address is whether it has narrow spec spectrum or broad spectrum activity. And so to do this, we're going to use the disk diffusion test method, also known as the Kirby-Bauer test. The Kirby-Bauer test will determine whether the bacteria is sensitive or resistant to a given antibacterial drug. Now, if it's sensitive, that means that the drug will kill or prevent its growth. And that's a good drug to use to treat an infection. However, if the bacteria is resistant to an antibacterial reagent, then that means that it has the antibacterial drug will have no effect on the bacteria and thus cannot be used to treat an infection. So the Kirby-Bauer test is purely a clinical test to determine the value of an antibacterial drug to treat a disease. Now notice that there will be no MIC or MBC values here. So let's go over the process of setting up a Kirby-Bauer test and interpreting the test. First, you want to start with a bacteria that was isolated from a patient because we want to work with a pure culture. We're going to take a cotton tip swab and transfer a small amount of bacteria from the plate and into a tube that either contains 0.9% sodium chloride or normal saline or phosphate buffered saline known as PBS. We want to have approximately 1.5 times 10 to the 8 cells per mil so that we don't overwhelm the assay. And to help us do that, we're going to compare the cloudiness of a 0.5 McFarland standard tube shown here on the left with the bacterial suspension that we've added into the PBS or the normal saline found in the right. Next, we're going to take a, a new swab and take a sample from our bacterial suspension and transfer it to the surface of a Mueller-Hinton auger plate. Now we want to swab the entire surface of this auger plate so that we get a solid line of bacteria after incubating. But before we incubate the plates, we're going to place some paper discs that contain known concentrations of various antibacterial reagents. Now on the left here is a dispenser that is often used in a clinical microbiology lab in order to dispense the antibacterial discs onto the surface of the auger plate. And on the right is an image of a plate that's been incubated overnight to allow the bacteria to grow on the surface. What you can notice is that there are areas around the discs that there is no bacterial growth. These areas are known as zones of inhibitions. We need to measure these zones of inhibitions using a metric ruler, and we're going to measure the, the diameter in millimeters. So the diameter of the area surrounding the disc that has no bacterial growth is the zone of inhibition. And if you look at this ruler, it shows that this particular zone of inhibition is 35 millimeters. Now we're going to record this in a chart similar to this, and in the rightmost column is where our results are going to be located. We're going to compare these numbers with each of the numbers in the same row. So for instance, in chloramphenicol, 
our results gave a zone of inhibition of six millimeters. Now six millimeters is less than 12 millimeters. Therefore, chloramphenicol is not a good antibacterial reagent to kill this bacteria because this bacteria is resistant to chloramphenicol. If we look at the next row, our results shows 18 millimeters for a zone of inhibition. If we compare the values for erythromycin, 18 millimeters is between 14 and 22. So there's a very little effect of the antibacterial reagent on the bacteria. So it's not a good choice. If we look at the next row for tetracycline, our results gave a zone of inhibition of 30 millimeters. 30 millimeters is greater than 19, and it follows under the S column. So S stands for sensitive or susceptible. This bacteria is sensitive to tetracycline and therefore can be used to treat the infection. So in summary, the kirby bauer test was used to determine whether a bacteria is sensitive or resistant to certain antibacterial drugs. Now when this is done multiple times with multiple bacterial strains, we have a good indication whether the antibacterial drug is a narrow spectrum or a broad spectrum antibacterial drug. Now all these antibacterial drugs can fall into six categories. We're going to call these the six modes of action. The reason why antibacterial drugs are effective with very low toxicity is because they have to target a factor of a bacteria that is not present in our cells. A lot of the antibacterial drugs will affect peptidoglycan synthesis. So they're going to target the production of peptidoglycan. This is a great target because our cells don't have cell walls and we do not produce peptidoglycan. Another mode of action is the cell membrane disruption. Yes, we have cell membranes. However, these drugs will actually target more specifically a prokaryotic cell membrane versus that of eukaryotic cell membrane. Folic acid metabolism is a good metabolism pathway because bacteria have such a pathway, whereas we do not. So that's a third mode of action. Protein synthesis. Bacteria have a small 70S ribosomes, whereas our cells will have 80S. We have 70S in our mitochondria, or the majority of our ribosomes are 80S ribosomes. So antibacterial drugs that target protein synthesis have more of an affinity with 70S ribosomes than that of 80S. The antibacterial drugs that inhibit RNA replication target RNA polymerase. The RNA polymerase found in bacteria are different than the RNA polymerase found in our cells. The last mode of action is that of DNA replication. Bacteria have a protein called DNA gyrase, whereas in our cells we have topoisomerase. These two proteins have the same function, but yet they're different proteins. So we're going to bank on this difference that the bacteria has, and we're going to use drugs that specifically target these unique bacterial components. Now, antibacterial uh, drugs are going to be grouped into classes based on which of these six groups that they can be characterized in. I'd like you to, to think about that these bacteria are not left defenseless against any antibacterial reagents. They basically have four general ways in which they can become resistant to any given bacteria, antibacterial drug. The first one is that the bacteria can modify the antibacterial drug target. So it's going to prevent the drug from interacting with it and having its effect. A second general mode of antibiotic resistance is that the bacteria can produce an enzyme that can modify the antibacterial agent in such a way that it could not, is no longer effective. The third mode of action of resistance would be that once the antibacterial reagent or drug enters the cell, it will be quickly removed from the cell. So I'm showing you a drug here on the right. It's going to enter the cell, and as soon as it enters, it is going to exit the cell using the efflux pump. So this bacteria is producing an efflux pump that will shuttle out the antibacterial drug as soon as it enters the cell. Therefore, it cannot reach its target. The last mode of resistance is the change in permeability. That means that some antibacterial drugs need to enter the cell. They need to be permeable. They need to go through the cell membrane. 
Well, if they don't have the right channel to go through, then they cannot enter their cell. So if the bacteria changes the permeability of that drug, it will prevent it from entering the cell, hence it will prevent it from meeting its target. This will conclude the topics covered in my antibacterial drug video.